Hello and thanks for joining us. Coming up. Today's guest had managed to stay anonymous for almost 50 years. Now the American author of The Wall Creeper and Mislaid is a writing star, pocketing six-figure advances and is championed by literary heavyweight Jonathan Franzen. She's in Paris for a reading at the legendary Shakespeare and Co. bookstore. Let's meet the woman who writes novels in less than a month and is being called a literary badass, Nell Zink. Now, welcome to the show. Hi. It's a pleasure to have you. Now, you've got one of the most fascinating backgrounds of anyone I've researched for an interview. <laughs> and to make a living, you've been a secretary, a cocktail waitress, a translator and a life model. In college, you were a bricklayer, during which time you taught yourself to speak French by reading Sartre. You've lived in many different places, the US, <laughs> Tel Aviv, Berlin, and now Bad Belzig in Brandenburg. You also have a keen interest in bird watching. It's all very eclectic. And um, before you wrote the book, The Wall Creeper, you were a secret writer and you first got published partly because of encouragement from Jonathan Franzen. Now, let's start with that. How did that come about? Well, um, I was trying to get him, because he had done a lot of activist work as a journalist uh, on behalf of birds, even European birds. It was, there was an article that came out in The New Yorker in 2010, in July, that I saw, and I thought, well, this article is pretty good, but he doesn't mention the Balkans. And I had a good friend who was working on birds in the Balkans and decided that I would force Jonathan Franson to write another article for The New Yorker about birds in the Balkans. <laughs> <laughs> and I decided to do this with sort of a, what they call in Germany, where I live, a charm offensive. So I wrote him, I just did my best to write him a charming letter. And it worked, it charmed him. Yeah, he was charmed. And he liked your writing. Yeah. And after that, you became pen pals. No, no, no. I think that was more of a one-sided thing. I think he's even been quoted on that. <laughs> I was his pen pal. And he was just in sort of a defensive posture, like <laughs> constantly saying, you know, I think as a writer, possibly you need a real outlet. You know, <laughs> letters to me is really not where you should be spending your time. But uh, you, you kind was, of wrote the wall creeper for him, though, didn't you? Yes, as a matter of fact, I did because he had written freedom. When I was doing my little charm offensive, as part of my research, I read freedom to see what his approach was uh, to bird conservation because I was a, I was like doing guerrilla. PR as a bird activist. That was my aim at the time, not to be a writer. And, um, and I saw that in, in Freedom, he was trying to combine a story about human beings and a story about birds uh, in a way that I didn't think integrated the two adequately and almost to make fun of him to his face, which is a very bad habit of mine. I just said, here's how you can tell a story in which Sex and birding are in, <laughs> inextricably linked. Okay, well, you've been um, at Paris of Shakespeare and Co. to meet some of your readers um, since you've been in Paris. Yeah. Here's what some of them had to say about your work. I like how, how sharp and cynical her writing is, and I like what strong, strong women she writes without trying to write strong women. They just feel real. They feel like people I've known. She has a very strong character and a very strong kind of um, um, storyteller. Uh, and I think maybe that has to do with that um, you know, she's, you know, herself has experienced uh, things in her life. I'm not sure, but you, know, you, you, would might, you might think so. When I was young and found the joy of reading, it was from certain American writers, Thomas Pynchon, Donald Barthelme, Kirk Vonnegut. There was an injunction at the time to say, make everything, get out of the normal habits of storytelling. And these authors all tried to do that. And I think Nell Zink does that very well herself. She's uh, very original, creative. If you expect something to happen, something different is going to happen. I can confirm it is very original storytelling. The opening sentence of The Wall Creeper, for example, is, I was looking at the map when Stephen swerved, hit the rock, and occasioned the miscarriage. I'm not sure I've ever read um, a book that starts with such a um, strong first line. Now, the book was described as one of the most exciting debut novels of the year when it was released. How would you describe it? For me, that's difficult because it, it, it falls for me into two very distinct sections. There's this first part that I wrote over the course of four days in 40 hours, in four days, 10 hours a day, simply for France and simply to impress and 
you know, ridicule him. <laughs> well, because, no, wait, there are things you shouldn't see on TV. There, there, <laughs> there are certain sexual practices that he sort of is soft on, shall we say, in freedom that I thought maybe should be regarded a little more critically and so on. And, you know, I, so, you know, I, I sort of get to the nitty gritty by about page four. So there's that first section of The Wall Creeper that was written just for him. And then what happened was I had to translate a, an extraordinarily boring book, and that took me two months. And only then did I have time to go back to this manuscript, and my mood was very different sort of dark and pessimistic. And so the rest of the book um, takes a very different turn. And it's a, so it's a young woman's search for meaning and identity, which is something the first part is not at all. In the first part, she's completely secure in herself, just casually going about her business of trying to make her life as enjoyable as, as she can. And then she is assailed by doubts and so the the latter two-thirds of the book are quite different. Well, one of the things that struck me was the sex in the book. Where did you learn to write about sex like that? Um, I didn't learn it. <laughs> I just... I, I think... Maybe under stress, I tend to be a rational person, like I'll fall back on trying to think, but of course I do it very, very poorly when I'm stressed. <laughs> so so um, I, when, when I'm talking about situations that are very emotional, I'll try to take a step back and think about um, tr trying to get a perspective that's a little more not aestheticized, but at least a little more phenomenological or something. Um, I don't know, but could, because what I'm talking around is just that what my friends say to me, like my good friends, they'll say, it's easy to talk about sex with you, Nell, because you never uh, get into that sort of pornographic thing of uh, where uh, you're trying to convey the f what it feels like. Okay. I, okay. I, I, I think people need to stay, read it to understand it's more like what we're talking about. Method acting or something. <laughs> I I pay attention to what's going on. Well, your second novel is mislaid. It's built on the model of a Shakespearean comedy, which is sort of a romp. Um, of mistaken identity and disguise, but re it's race swapping as opposed to cross-dressing. Um, there's a marriage in the book that's a, between a gay male poet and a lesbian college student. Um, your books feature characters who are shaped by the structure of their marriage, very irregular marriages. I know you've been married twice. I'm guessing from these books that maybe that's not something that's going to happen again. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> I... I've I've definitely uh, sworn off marriage. I don't know why. You know, it's to the point now where when I hear a young man say, I want to marry that girl, I think this is an act of aggression. Because in my life, you know, looking back on my life at my advanced age, I think, you know, is there anything more wonderful, more pleasant than falling in love? And when you marry someone, what you're saying to that person is, you have already fallen in love for the last time. <laughs> you will never, ever do it again. And that is cold. Okay. You know, I, this is not a sympathetic or kind thing to say to a person. And so I, I regard marriage as surely very odd. Okay. Well, you don't shy away from the big stuff. Sexuality, the status of women, desire, race... Um, most writers steer clear of race. They definitely don't laugh at it in their writing. Um, you address it head on. And this is sort of a high comedy of racial identity. Now, I know that you spent some of your time growing up in a community in rural Virginia where the community was a mixture of black people and members of the Ku Klux Klan. How did that shape your view on race then? And is that why you sort of wanted to bring it out here? Well, it was important to me when I was writing that book to uh, make clear that racism isn't bad just for the people on the bottom. It's not, in Tidewater, Virginia, it wasn't only a problem for black people that there was racism. It warps the white people. You know, I should have, you know, been launched 
on the world at the age of 18 as a, a tolerant, broad-minded person without a speck of racism anywhere in her body, but try to be like that if you grow up in Tidewater, Virginia, where there's such systematic uh, and at that time still almost state-sanctioned discrimination that y you can really just, you feel like there are not d somehow inborn, but there were practical differences between white people and black people. And at the same time, there were only these two categories. And so many people were somewhere in between, so that it would happen regularly that you would meet someone who um, looked, uh, say, like you. I mean, I think it's entirely possible that your hair is not naturally quite that blonde, right? <laughs> so, okay, you have dark eyes, you have um, and, and I would meet someone who looks like you, and they would s just casually mention along the way that they're black. This, is, this was perfectly normal, because uh, being black was, was passed along from any parent, from any, any ancestor you ever had who was black, made you black. So, and there were only two categories to choose from. That's changed radically in my lifetime. Both books address political issues. Why is it important for you in your writing to do that? Well, you know, how boring is a book if it's not political? I, it's just really important to me um, to address political issues because that's where the action is. That's what people are interested in. And um, I think... There's a sort of ivory tower, arty novel that is still being written by a lot of people that I think, you know, that was fine back in the era of formal experimentation with the novel in the 1920s, but, you know, come on, people. You know, the, uh, life has become very political for all of us. What can you tell us in a sentence, because we're out of time, about your new book that's coming out, Nicotine? Nicotine is the story of a young woman who falls in love with a man who chews tobacco. Okay. And <laughs> could I have one more sentence? Yeah. <laughs> he, this is, um, she tries to get him off it. It's not easy. Okay. Nels, it's been a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you so much for joining us. A reminder that Nels' books, The Wall Creeper, and Miss Laid are out now, and Nicotine is due out later this year. Remember our website, we're also on Twitter and Facebook. There's more news coming up on France 24 after this. <laughs>